good corporate citizenship is about taking responsibility for our communities. It's not, by, it's not about coming up with some brilliant words that convince people that we're taking responsibility for our community. And these sponsors have really gone the distance. This is the fourth year that we're in of the speakers program. Uh, and we have seen thousands and thousands now of people come and in many cases become addicted uh, to this process. There are good addictions and learning throughout life and especially learning how to make this a more productive planet certainly among those, uh, those challenges that we can seek out. Um, this speaker, I think, today, Bob Vanarak, is a speaker who personifies this speaker series as no other speaker has. Um, Bob Vanarak is a person who not just, didn't just learn about values-based leadership, doesn't just talk about val uh, values-based leadership, but Bob Vanarak has practiced it, and he's practiced it under some of the most extreme hardships that we would see in the corporate world. Uh, he is the fellow who would come into a company when the company was on the verge of bankruptcy, uh, when, uh, met, when the CEO had been indicted by the SEC, uh, when the stockholders had completely lost their faith and their trust in the leadership of a corporation. He's done this with New York Stock Exchange companies, large companies, and small companies. He's led major divisions of companies as large as Pitney Bowles. So this is a man who has road tested the theory. Now here at this school, we talk a lot about values-based leadership, uh, but for most of the professors that are teaching this, I mean, they're wonderful people and they read a lot. Uh, they read what people like Bob Vanarak have to say, but they haven't had the experience of doing it. Uh, Bob graduated from the top of his class when he got his master's uh, from Harvard. Um, at Harvard Business School. Uh, at that time, Harvard Business School didn't know what values-based leadership was. This is not something he learned in a classroom. This is something that he learned because it came from inside of him, because he felt that this is the way you create high-performance corporations, that this is the only way we can sustain uh, the kind of effort that is going to make capitalism the sort of thing that is good for the planet not just good for stockholders, not just good for boards of directors, but good for all stakeholders. And in the process of that, it becomes also the best for stockholders as well. It's really an odd kind of thing, an unintended consequence. So I'm going to challenge you today as you listen to Bob, who has spent a great deal of time the last few years thinking about this, uh, this particular form of leadership. Think about some hard questions, because this is the guy who's probably faced them in the real world. We don't understand a theory until we try it out for ourselves, right? I mean, I can learn how to write about a theory, but it's the things that come up in the workplace in real life that I didn't learn about in the classroom and forgot to think about, you know, as I walked into a position. Uh, Bob has done that. Uh, so I want you to challenge him and challenge the theory of values-based leadership. I want each one of you to dig down inside and try to come up with something that uh, he can help you with uh, because you don't have this kind of talent every day. Um, it's a great pleasure to call Bob Vanarak my friend and my associate. And Bob, help us to learn something. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sam. I really appreciate that beautiful introduction. It's an honor for me to be here. And I really want to congratulate you as the founder of this Voices of Experience program, which has brought such richness to this university. I think we all are really greatly indebted to Sam Cassidy for the Voices of Experience program. Thanks, Bob. <clears throat> the topic that I've chosen for today is uh, searching for great leadership. And I think it's appropriate that we are doing it here at Daniels. I think Daniels is an extraordinary institution. You talk about issues that we didn't talk about when I was in school, sustainability and values-based leadership and the triple bottom line and corporate responsibility. Uh, you have an outstanding faculty. You have outstanding leaders like Sam. Uh, Jim O'Toole is now, uh, now here on your faculty. And, and I've been privileged to be in many of your classrooms as a 
guest speaker and as an instructor, and, and I know how, how good the students are here and, and, and how interested you are in this, and I'm really counting on you uh, for doing some things much better than my generation did. I want to give uh, some acknowledgement now to my colleague in putting together these remarks, uh, my much younger brother, uh, Greg, who's back over here, uh, actually my son, uh, Greg, who is uh, in, in his own right an entrepreneur and leadership scholar, and uh, he has a book coming out in March called Life Entrepreneurs, Ordinary People Creating Extraordinary Lives. It's from uh, Josie Bass. It's a Warren Bennis book, and I've read the manuscript, and it's really outstanding. So Greg has to leave about five to catch an airplane, so if he walks out, it's nothing personal here. Uh, but I want to acknowledge Greg's contribution here. My background, as Sam said, is in, is in crucibles. Uh, companies or divisions of companies going through extreme strategic challenges or on the verge of bankruptcy because they were accused of ethical uh, scandals. And so as a result, I have a lot of scars. <laughs> I have made a lot of mistakes, and it's through those mistakes that I, that I learned a lot of things as I examined deeply some of the, some of the questions that, that haunt all of us. And I want to share uh, some of those uh, learnings with you uh, today. As we think about uh, great leadership, um, who do we think about? We think about the kind of people that you see up here on the screen, right? You think about great leaders, and you can identify uh, some people there that, uh, that you would uh, say, certainly that, uh, that person, Gandhi or Lincoln or Churchill, um, he or she was a great leader. Well, I want to offer, Greg and I want to offer you some provocative issues to think about a little bit today. It's going to be kind of a fire hose of information, so I'm going to go quickly through this stuff. I certainly can't pretend these are the final answers, but I really welcome your questions and your challenges, as, as, uh, Sam, uh, as Sam said. Rather than thinking about leaders, I'd like us to think a lot more about leadership. Leadership. Uh, leadership from a group of people. And so we, we picked off the web uh, some, some pictures here of hopefully groups of people that you can identify with. You can see up in the, in the upper left there uh, Lincoln's cabinet. There's a book from uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin called Team of Rivals. Team of Rivals. If you haven't read that, I heartily recommend it to you. It's a great history book, but it's also about how Lincoln this country lawyer from Kentucky and Illinois, who wasn't expected to win the presidency, beat out some of the preeminent, well-educated people of his time. And he was really savaged by them during the campaign. And what he did was he brought them into his cabinet, people like Seward and Chase and Stanton and Bates. And at this time, when our country was facing probably its greatest crisis, this team of rivals came together, and at first they didn't have much appreciation for Lincoln. But over time, a, a, a wonderful thing emerged in terms of great leadership, and it saved this country. You see uh, JFK's cabinet, that was during the Cuban Missile Crisis. You see the framers uh, of our Constitution. Uh, you see the women's uh, U.S. soccer team that won at the Olympics and the World Cup and really subjugated their individual egos and came together as an extraordinary team. You probably can't see it because of the light here, but I've got uh, uh, Frodo and Mary and Pippin uh, and Samwise Ganji from Lord of the Rings. We don't have Gandalf or Aragon or Boromir there, but I hope you can relate to this, that this, is, this was an extraordinary quest when Middle Earth was threatened, and these people came together as a leadership team, and each one, in their way, did extraordinary things. And that's going to be kind of a theme that runs through some of my remarks here. It's probably appropriate to talk a little bit about my own search for great leadership. I can divide it really into three phases. When I got out of business school, my goal was simple. I want to run something. Now think about those words. I want to run, be in control, be in charge of, chief honcho, chief commander, something. Didn't even matter what. I want to run something. Clearly this was, 
This was an ego, this was a power-based, even though I didn't realize it at the time, approach. And as I got into my first job, uh, in my second job, I was working really hard, traveling all the time and never home, flying out on Sunday and coming back on Friday. We were acquiring a lot of companies and integrating them in. And integrating is a euphemism for young Turk MBAs come in and fire off the old management and close the plant and, and do all these terrible things. And I said to myself, this just doesn't feel right. This isn't the way we ought to be running businesses. There should be a better way. And I said, what can I do about that? I, I can read about it, I can maybe go figure it out and teach, or I can, I can write about it. No, I think I want to go out and try and find a better way. I want to put myself in harm's way by getting into some very difficult circumstances to see if we can find if there is a better way to lead companies. And over a period of time, uh, through several years and lots of pain and lots of scars, I think I found that way. And I'd like to share it with you today, at least from my perspective. So, this search for, late, for great, lead, great leadership is really almost becoming a desperate search today. I think the world is hungering for great leadership. Harvard's Kennedy School recently reported that 75% of the people they surveyed believe we're in a leadership crisis today. Scandals abound. The subprime mortgage scandal. People who didn't have incomes, didn't have assets, you know, who would sell them these kinds of mortgages? Or back in the Tyco and WorldCom days. Or look at the sports world with the steroids scandal or the Tour de France or or, or, or the dogfighting scandal with uh, Michael Vick. Or look at government scandals. The, 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 the incidence of leadership with unethical principles is, is just abounding today. And so the world is really hungering for great leadership. And as I've thought about leadership and studied it, I've discovered that there, there's no standard definition of leadership, let alone great leadership. There are hundreds and hundreds of different definitions of what leadership is, and hundreds of different adjectives that come before the word leadership. Heroic leadership, charismatic leadership, transformational leadership, level five leadership, servant leadership. And so it's no wonder that the people in the world today are confused about what is great leadership today. I think there are some premises about leadership today that that many people have. Great leaders are born, they know what to do, they tell people what to do, they're in control of the situation, they're the authority, they have the power, they need to protect that power because people want to take it away. There can only be one leader and then there are followers. And that leader is hopefully heroic and charismatic and speak well and is telegenic in today's world, uh, and that leadership is really lonely. Leadership has to meet the expectations of the followers, and leadership has to care for everyone. What do you think those 12 things have in common? I contend that they're all myths. There's some truth but they're all myths. And they put us on a wrong path of wrong thinking about what great leadership really is. And it's such a weak foundation for such a critical subject. The model can really be called the industrial classical model. It's summed up in the quote that history is made by great leaders. I'm sure you've probably heard that. We heard it from Plato in The Philosopher King. We heard it from Machiavelli 500 years ago in The Prince. We heard it in the great man, certainly not great woman, great man theories of leadership. And it led us, leads us to the single leader model. And that single leader has certain traits and characteristics and skills which we've studied. We used to study height of leaders. Do you have to be six feet four, as George Washington was, or Charles de Gaulle was? You know, can you really be a leader if you're five feet four or something like that? And unfortunately, it leads us to heroic leaders, Superman, 
got Paris Hilton there as a celebrity leader. For those of you who are football fans, Terrell Owens, now with the Dallas Cowboys, he didn't have a bad year, but when he was with the Philadelphia Eagles, he was all about T.O. You know, if you don't know T.O., substitute Donald Trump or substitute Amorosa. Well, as we thought about it, we said that this kind of leadership often leads us to amoral leaders or sometimes even immoral leaders. I don't know how many times as I worked in the private equity world or venture capital world, somebody would come to me and say, Bob, you gonna make your numbers this quarter? You gonna make your numbers, Bob? You gonna make your numbers, aren't you? Sure. Sure. <laughs> the intimidation of making your numbers. Just do it. Nike has a great slogan, Nike's a great company, but I worry about that slogan, just do it. Do what, how, how do I make my numbers? When the customer asks me, will the software do that? And they've said, I've gotta make my numbers and I don't really know, what's the temptation? Oh, sure the software will do that. And you lie, and you start down that slippery slope. Does that resonate with any of you? I see a couple of smiles in the audience. Well, that's what I experienced. There's an old pop song, Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places. Any of you remember that one? I think it's like leadership. I think we're looking for leadership in all the wrong places. And as I've thought about it, and Greg and I have worked on it, we've discovered that great leadership is not what or where we thought it would be. I'm told there are three fundamental motives for why people want to lead. Power, or the synonym for power, prestige, position, status, money, corporate office, private parking place, whatever it may be. Primarily a motivation for power. Or achievement, the desire to build something, to achieve something, to, to uh, make the world a better place. Or finally, service, wanting to serve other people. And I had the privilege to meet Robert Greenleaf, the author of Servant Leadership, and, and learn a lot from him about his great essays. Clearly, I want to run something, as Bob came out with his fresh MBA, was number one. And uh, a lot of what I'll talk about is how I discovered number two and number three. The model that we've developed of great leadership, which I now teach in class and which I've summarized into some points, is as follows. It's built on somebody who maintains a healthy personal core. And I'm gonna go briefly through each of these five in this fire hose of information here, and then I'll open up to your questions. Maintains a healthy personal core. Synthesizes a shared future. Collaboratively aligns. Embraces plural leadership. And finally achieves substantive positive results. Now I'll be the first to admit that no one of us, because we're human, is gonna be perfect on all of these. These are like arrows in the quiver. The more arrows you have, the better you're able, you're able to defend or to attack. Nobody's ever gonna have all the quivers. So you can certainly cite a leader uh, who may not have had a completely healthy personal core, or may not have done a great job on collaborative alignment. But the more of these that you have in your quiver, the better off you're gonna be. Let's go through them quickly one by one. Healthy personal core. I think it's presumptuous to think that we can lead other people until we can start to lead ourselves. Um, the Greeks talked about knowing yourself. And so we've divided it into uh, four areas. Body, mind, emotions, and heart. Leadership is not a sprint. Leadership is a series of marathons. Tremendous stress. Tremendous challenge, as those of you who are in leadership positions know. And believe me, my friends, if you're not eating right, if you're drinking too much booze, if you're on drugs, if you're not getting enough sleep, it's really hard to sustain it. I got along on five, six hours sleep for many years, and people would look at me and say, Bob, you look so tired. What's wrong? I'd get so mad. I'm a guy who needs eight or nine hours sleep. I used to have to run. I'd get up at five o'clock in the morning, even though I'm working 80 hours a week to run, because running was my creative time. It was time to get my endorphins right. 
and, 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 and so I was able to maintain some health that way. Uh, the mind. A friend of mine, Chuck Weckendorfer, says, your ego is not your amigo. And that's what the mind can do to you. You get into a leadership position and people start telling you, oh, Bob, you're wonderful. I'm so glad that you're here. You're our savior. Oh, we've needed you for a long time. And after a while, with people blowing in your ear, you begin to believe that crap. And suddenly you think, well, they need me. I'm wonderful, you know, and it's very hard for former CEOs, Doug Riggs and I were talking about this before, to, to walk away and let somebody else come in there. Doug's done a marvelous job of that. The ego is the enemy of great leadership. Of course you have to have ambition. Of course you have to have drive. But it's not for your personal gratification. It's for the group. It's for the cause. Jim Collins writes in his, his book, Good to Great, about level five leadership. And he talks about the leader having having a great drive to succeed for the group, but also balancing that with humility. And that leads us to the third area, emotions. Of course, you've been exposed to the books by Goldman on emotional uh, control or uh, emotional intelligence. I came from a very angry family. My father worked hard. He had a very tough life. But he was an angry man. And I was angry when I was a kid. Uh, and I took it out aggressively on the football field. And I could channel that energy. I was a middle linebacker back when you didn't have to be 220 pounds. And I was a vicious middle linebacker. I used to channel that anger. I used to hit people, you know. And I thought that was okay. And I married my high school sweetheart and talked about, well, that's just the way I am, honey. You know, I, I'm just, I just, what can I do? It's my genes. It's what I learned when I was a kid. And what I learned through her coaching and other people, that's, that's also a bunch of crap. Emotions are normal. Fear is normal. Anger is normal. Excitement is normal. Emotional control is what you, it's what you do in that nanosecond after you feel that anger or that fear. Courage is not the absence of fear. It's the willingness to proceed in spite of that fear. It's the emotional control that's there. And so emotional control, I think, is a really essential characteristic of, of good leadership. There's a great quote about anger. Your management of an attack determines your fate, not the substance of the attack. Your management of an attack determines your fate, not the substance. You're going to be attacked in leadership positions. People are going to come at you hard and heavy, as we see in the political campaign. Politics is a contact sport. It's how you react to that. You get down in the mud there too, or do you maintain your composure and manage your way through it? The substance you can deal with later. It's not giving in to that emotional outburst that can really undermine your leadership. And finally, I think the most important element of transforming yourself first is heart. And here I like to think of heart in terms of the way Parker Palmer in some of his books described it. And I'll read it here if you don't mind. The center in the human self where everything comes together where will and intellect and values and feeling and intuition and vision all converge, the source of one's integrity. Leadership requires heart. Some people might call it a sense of spirit or something greater than yourself. Great leadership, I think, requires one to be in touch with their own personal values. Decisions are made not so much by facts, Facts are important, but the weighting of those facts, what's more important, that comes back to your value system. And if you haven't outlined your personal values, you're really subject to the winds of change. Whoever's blowing in your ear most recently or presenting you the most biased facts, until you can put those facts in a values context and have a moral compass. A moral compass, I think, is essential for great leadership. And if you integrate all of those, as Greg said, it says in his book, then you can lead an authentic and integrated life. He and I began debating 20 years ago about commitment versus balance. I was, you don't understand, son. You want to be successful, you've got to be committed. It's 80 hour weeks, it's committed. Committed, you've got to be committed. And he was saying, but dad, there's got to be some things more than that to life. Just working crazy, crazy, crazy. So 
he talks about that at length, about how one has, and I think your generation has a much better chance to lead an authentic, integrated life. All right, point number two, synthesizes a shared future. I do not buy in, these are all Bob's opinions, I do not buy in that it's the leader's vision. Uh-oh, did we lose something? Okay, I heard a beep beep, sorry. I do not buy into the premise that it's the leader's vision. The average CEO has a tenure of four to five years now. Does that mean every four to five years an organization gets a new vision? I don't think so. I think it comes down to something more than vision, and we've defined three elements to a shared future, as we call it. Shared values, a purpose for our organization, and a shared vision. If you look back to the founding fathers, Thomas Paine did an extraordinary job of that during the Revolutionary War when he wrote some of the common sense pamphlets. And he really inspired the farmers and merchants that were here in our country then about independence from Britain and about liberty and about opportunity. Martin Luther King was a great one. I don't know if you've seen, maybe some of you saw in person, I've seen the video clips of his I Have a Dream speech. It just brings shivers to me. It's so good. And he was reading there in front of the uh, uh, monument in Washington from a prepared script. And it was a pretty good speech because he's a Baptist minister. He'd been preaching a lot and been marching and was in touch with the people. But if you notice in the clip, someone behind him says, Martin, tell him about the dream. Martin, tell him about the dream. And he looks away from his prepared script and he starts speaking from the experiences that he has had in Selma, Alabama, and Birmingham, and Atlanta, and Chicago with gangs. He starts speaking from his heart and he knew what the people wanted. And he talked about the Red Hills of Georgia and the, and the Rocky Mountains of Colorado and, and Stone Mountain and little black girls and white girls being able to hold hands and sit down together. And suddenly you could just see and sense and feel a whole different thing as he synthesized a shared dream. Now what is synthesis? Synthesis is not summary. Summary is A, B, C, summarized as A prime, B prime, B, uh, A prime, B prime, C prime. Synthesis is a process of deep listening, of connection, of respect and trust listening more and talking less, until you really understand what's in the hearts of people. And then you can articulate something new. Synthesis is not A, B, C, it's D. And D is something new, but it includes A, and it includes B, and it includes C. And people resonate with it. And you may have to draft and redraft that, but at some point people say, yes, that's the dream. That's the vision. That's the future that I want. And here are the values that we want to operate by, that we commit ourselves to, that are sacrosanct, and we'll follow those values. We know any individual person may fail us, but the values won't. And so I think that's what great leadership involves, synthesizing a shared future. A small example from my past, I was... Uh, CEO of a division of uh, Pitney Bowes back in the 80s. This is the first time this really hit home with me. And we uh, were working on our uh, company purpose and mission statement. And I drafted most of it and gave it to the executive staff and they wordsmithed it a little bit. And my predecessor had started a series of meetings in the cafeteria at, uh, on all three shifts for the major plant we had there. This is in Dayton, Ohio. And the first line of the revised mission statement said, our mission is to maximize our shareholders' return on invested capital, and then it went on, blah, 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 yuck, yuck, yuck. So I got up there at the first shift, and we give them the quarterly update and told them about the company picnic coming up and all that, and I said, well, we just drafted our new, new mission statement here. It is we're going to maximize shareholders' return on invested capital. Blah, blah, blah. Anybody have any questions? Everybody's just sitting in the audience just like this, arms and legs crossed. Oh, great, okay. Second shift, 8 o'clock that night, uh, same thing, sitting like this. But you love third shift people who work midnight to 8 a.m. You know, they're a little independent and uh, willing to be risk takers. So 
5 a.m. in the cafeteria, I'd go through maximize your orders. Anybody have any questions? There in the back of the room, somebody raises their hand. Oh, yeah, I've got a question. She said, Mr. Vanerick, you know, I really have no idea what maximized shareholders' return on invested capital is. And anyway, that's not why I work here at Monarch Marking Systems. And I said, well, but, but don't you understand about profit and we've got to reinvest and grow and shareholders? Well, I, I think so, but, you know, that's not why I work here. Well, I said, why do you work here? Well, I'm proud of the products that we make. And I love the people here. I love the way we treat each other. And you know, I come in contact with customers and I love helping customers solve their problems. And you know, I'm paid okay, you know, but um, that's why I work here. And so I said, gee, maybe we better take this draft mission statement. This is well before the days of email. And we'll send it out to everybody in the company. We had operations in quite a few countries. We sent it out to everybody. We said, give us your thoughts. Send it in by fax or write us a letter or come in and see us and HR will help us. And we began a dialogue inside that company about what our purpose really was, what we really wanted to do, and how we were going to operate. And it took about six months and we rewrote that mission statement. Profitability was still there, but it was a residual. And it, you know, we got in wacko things. We got Back, this is back in the 80s, we got even, let's hug the trees in those days, you know. Turn to Jesus, okay. We got a lot of good stuff. And as a result of that dialogue, we recrafted our mission statement, our value statement, and suddenly we had a company that was coming alive. And people really bought into it. And that was my little experience with starting to synthesize a shared future. The third point, collaborative alignment. I don't know about your experience. My experience is that most organizations are pretty dysfunctional. People well-intentioned, but not really knowing how they fit in, not really knowing what their job is, what somebody else is doing next door, really confused about how it all fits together. And as a result, being frustrated and not being there completely. And most of the things that I've read on alignment are terribly complex. They're, they're, they're really for big organizations. So I, I wrote up this alignment process, and I've used it many, many times, and I found it to be very valuable. It goes from the very broad to the very specific, long-term to short-term, strategic to tactical. And it talks about what's our purpose? What are our shared values? What's our vision? A little shorter time frame now, 10 years out. What are some specific measurable goals we want to achieve three or four years from now? What's our strategy? How are we going to structure and organize ourselves? What processes should we use and discard? What metrics are we going to use in each department? Not 25, but five or six metrics, measurements of things we're going to measure every day, every week. What actions are we going to take? Who will do what by when? Now we're into the next quarter, the next month, the next week. Sam will rewrite the marketing plan to enter the European market by September 30th and have an actionable plan. Who will do what by when? And finally, the feedback system, because the world changes out there very quickly. And the feedback system says, what are we going to me measure, look at, talk about, how are we going to revise things? Now, all of that is, is there any rocket science up there? A anything that's not common sense? In my opinion, 95% of the organizations out there do not go through that. They may have a vision, they may have some MBO action plan for you, but it's not all collaboratively done, linked together, widely communicated, and as a result, the oars are hitting the water at different times. Collins and Porus wrote back in the 90s in an article entitled, Building a Visionary Company, the quote is right there. Building a visionary company requires 1% vision and 99% alignment. Alignment may be your most important work. Here's a little more on alignment. But I really want to emphasize what alignment leads to. And I do it through a quote Greg 
found for me called Swing. And I'll read it to you if you don't mind, because it just it inspires me, and I like to get inspired. It's from David Halbertson's The Amateurs. When most oarsmen talked about their perfect moments in a boat, they referred not so much to winning a race as to the feel of the boat, all eight oars in the water together, the synchronization almost perfect. In moments like these, the boat seemed to lift right out of the water. And oarsmen call that the moment of swing. Has anybody in the audience ever experienced moments of swing with a group of people? Raise your hand if you have. What's it like? Sir, what's it like? Sort of an undescribable feeling. If you try to put, I'm, I'm repeating for the uh, audio tape here. If you try to put parameters around it, you lose it. Yeah. Wasn't it wonderful? Certainly something you try to achieve again. Most people experience it on a sports team or something like that. I have experienced it in the business world. In the depths of the valleys of despair, when the cash flow was just about out, and we found a way to get it together, and we came through, it was extraordinary. And I tell you, my friends, I'm not kidding. I get goosebumps standing here right now thinking about it. That's how life-changing it was for people who went through those moments of swing when the group of people came together and did extraordinary things. And in order to get that, you need to be collaboratively aligned. Another story. My first alignment experience. I'm going back to some of my early experiences because I'm going to build on them was, again, back in Dayton, Ohio, that company that we did the 5 a.m. in the cafeteria thing. We were a price marking company. We made tags and labels and the machines that put them on garments or cans of peas, and barcodes had just come out. And so our whole business model was in the toilet. We're going to go out of business. So I said, well, I'll take on that company. <laughs> so, I, so I stepped in there, and we decided to make barcodes an opportunity for us rather than a threat. We brought out a barcode printer called the 2040, and it was about as big as these three chairs here. And, and it was one of the first uh, standalone barcode printers, and it was a real clunkety-clunk machine. And so I was talking with uh, a brilliant vice president of engineering that I had, Bud Klein, and he said, well, what do you think we ought to do next, Bob? And I said, well, clearly a tabletop version. And he said, that's what everybody else expects us to do. He said, I've got some ideas about how we could build a handheld barcode printer. I said, Bud, we just brought out this clunkety-clunk. How are we going to go from a clunkety-clunk to a hand? We said, well, we're going to have to use a skunk works. And I said, what's a skunk works? And he said, well, it's something Lockheed invented many years ago, and other companies have since used, Apple and others have used it. But you get a, a group of uh, volunteers, and you relieve them of all their responsibilities. And you give them a very focused mission and task, put them in special quarters, and you give them this unbelievable assignment, and more often than not, they do it. And so I said, well, that's great, but we got one problem. We got Pitney Bowes, our parent company. This is going to be a three or four million dollar project. The time frame is normally three or four years, and uh, you want to bring this out in 18 months in order to set the standard for the handheld barcode industry. If we bring out the first one, we'll set the standard. And Bud said, well, yeah, that's where you come in. Because you have to run, he's delegating upwards to me now, the CEO. You have to run interference with the suits at Pitney Bowes. I said, oh, geez. So uh, we set out the parameters for the Pathfinder, as we called it. 18 months it had to be introduced. Number one. Number two, certain functionality. Number three, certain unit cost. Number four, certain program cost. 
And if you had to trade off any of the alternatives there, trade them off in that order. Trade off functionality for date, unit cost for functionality. So it was a very clear set of guidelines. But the other thing was, we just synthesized our company mission and our values. And so we said, we're going to have to operate on the Skunk Works team by these values. These values are sacrosanct. And I will delegate to you on this team all my power as the CEO. Hire, fire, any rule or regulation in the book. You can uh, spend what you want, you can do what you want, but you must hit the date, functionality, unit cost, program cost, and you must operate by the company values. And we got 20 volunteers to sign up from all the different disciplines. And they went off to invent this thing in half the normal time. And I can remember still to this day calling the head of internal audit at Pitney Bowes, a friend of mine, Carm Edamondo. And I said, Carm, this is Bob down in Dayton. You might want to make a, a note of this conversation. And he said, why? I said, well, you know, we brought out this 2040 thing, and it's kind of clunky, and we got a vision of this handheld barcode printer. He said, wow, that sounds great. That would set the corporate standard. Uh, I said, yeah, but uh, there's one thing, Carm. We have to start the project now, and we have this prospectus that Pitney Bowes required. And you would write up this prospectus and do the market research and all that and send it up and go to various departments and they'd ask questions. It took about a year to get a prospectus approved. And I said, Carm, we're starting the project today. I was really cheeky in those days. He said, you can't do that. I said, I know, but we're going to do it anyway. But what about the prospectus? Well, I'm writing it. I'm coming up next week. I'm going to go to all the departments and the engineering and corporate strategy, and we're going to answer all it. I spent the next year in deep doo-doo. I mean, I was in really big trouble, you know. And, uh, but I got through it, and we introduced the world's first handheld barcode printer. This is in 1983. may look a little old to you now. This was way ahead of its time. This became the most successful product in the history of the company. It set the industry standard. It was a home run. And it changed me and the people involved. Because everybody who was on that Skunk Works team refused to go back to their old job. They said, I can't go back to working in engineering or purchasing. It's just going to kill me. I want to operate this way all the time. So we changed the way Monarch operated. Almost everything we did was or organized around special action teams, clear goals, shared values, group selecting each other, a whole bunch of things. And that's when that company really started to soar. And subsequently, almost everything that I did in my business career was organized around this kind of approach of collaborative alignment, of synthesizing a shared future, of clear goals, and things like that. I've had some successes in, uh, in, in my career. We took Monarch's product development time from three to four years down to a year and a half. I got promoted at Pitney Bowes to be group vice president. And they said, could you do that stuff that you did down there in Dayton up here? We had 20% defects in our product line, postage meters, mailing machines. 20% defects at the end of the assembly line. In four years, we had 2% defects and won the Malcolm Baldrige Award for the state of Connecticut. Special action teams, this kind of stuff. At Sensormatic, when I took over as CEO of that company, a billion dollar company in the midst of a huge ethical scandal, the cash flow was a negative $100 million a year. In four years, it was a positive cash flow of $100 million a year. Now, how, how did we do that? Brings me to the fourth point, plural leadership. Let the values-based colleagues lead. Those successes, do you think it was because Bob knew how to do a handheld barcode printer? You think it was because Bob was an expert on quality assurance? No. It's because of the people that were there, the ebb and flow of leadership that went back and forth within the hierarchy. 
course you have a CEO, of course you have vice presidents, but there was an ebb and flow of leadership that went back. Sometimes from the people with authority, the directors of the vice presidents, frequently from people without authority. I remember we used to have brown bag lunches at uh, Sensormatic where people could sign up to have brown bag lunch with the CEO. Bring in your brown bag lunch and an apple and sit around a conference room. Because people are a little reluctant to speak, uh, we go around the table. Who are you? Where do you work? How long have you been here? Any questions about the company? Around the table. And then we always had a, had, had a particular problem we were facing. So we wanted to get the creative juices flowing. So we were talking one day in a brown bag lunch about some problem we were having. And suddenly I had a flash of brilliance. I, I knew a great idea to solve this problem. And I was waiting for my turn, because I took a turn, too, to come around to show my idea. Because I would show how smart I was and how worthy of being the CEO. As we're going around, about two people before me, Kathy says my idea. I go, oh, shoot. Shoot, she stole my idea. She didn't really steal it. So what would normally happen, someone might say, well, that's a great idea, Kathy. I was thinking the same thing. Let me tell you about what I was thinking. You know. But I, was, I was, must have been thinking particularly clearly that day because I said, Kathy, that really sounds interesting. Tell me about that. That's interesting. Kathy, would you go up to the whiteboard and sketch that out? Kathy sketches it out. Kathy left that room in charge of a special action team to explore and implement that idea, which, by the way, worked. And everybody wanted to be in charge of a special action team. Kathy was an engineer. She, doesn't, she wasn't a supervisor, wasn't a manager. But she was in charge of a special action team that had some higher level people on that team. And wow, Kathy loved it. And other people loved it. Plural leadership flows out of that. As Jim O'Toole, your chair of business ethics, says here, one must become a leader of leaders. And this kind of, of, of action really, my friends, spoils you forever. Now, how does one deal with plural leadership? How do you get to it? You know, some of the stuff I talk about is easy to understand. It, it's, it's hard to do. So we created this matrix, a plural leadership matrix. It's here, whether you're aligned with the shared future there or not aligned. So alignment with the shared future. And whether you're engaged or not engaged with the company. Engaged means you're active. You're influencing other people. You're, you're, you're making things happen. So you got four quadrants. This is, this is an MBA place. You've got to have a matrix, right? So, so here's Bob's matrix. Up here, you got the great people, the plural leaders. They're actively engaged, influencing others, and they're aligned with the shared future. Over here, oh, my laser light just went out. Oh, there it is. Over here, you've got people who are aligned with the, with the shared future, but they're not actively influencing others yet. These are your potential plural leaders. Up here are the collaborators. Here are the potential plural leaders. Some of them will choose to become plural leaders and influence others. Others will say, no, I don't want to lead, but, I'm, but I am aligned. I'm going to be a good follower. Leadership is a choice. And good followers are really necessary there. So that's a good group. Over here, you've got the bystanders. They are neither aligned with the shared future that you've outlined, nor are they engaged. And you really can't afford, in today's competitive world, people who are not aligned and not engaged. They're really taking up space. Those people have to ultimately, if they don't move, become casualties. But here is the real problem group. These are people who are engaged, they're influencing others, they're opinion leaders, but they're not aligned with where the organization has decided they want to go. These are the people who are the whiners, the mutterers, the saboteurs, the unguided missiles, the destructive achievers, high performers, but they leave a wake of destruction behind them. And these people, in my experience, have to be given the opportunity to move out of that box. But if they don't, they need to become casualties. And that's one of the hard decisions of leadership. You have to be careful about how they become casualties, because if you don't treat them respectfully, honoring their past and their contribution and have some transitions, they can, you can really destroy the values-based culture that you're trying, trying to inculcate. 
But if you let the organization know that we won't stand for the unguided missiles and the destructive achievers, we gave them a chance. They didn't want to get with the program. They're a round peg in a square hole. They're happier somewhere else. And so leadership has to move those people out, in my opinion. At the first constitutional convention, when the delegates from the states got together, 25% of the delegates walked out. They were so outraged by the Constitution that was proposed. Two of the 13 states refused to sign it, North Carolina and Rhode Island. You're always going to have some people who don't want to get with the program. And those people frequently have to become casualties. So you see here, I think one of the preeminent examples of plural leadership, the founders of our republic and the framers of our constitution. I don't have time to read the many names. There are dozens and dozens of people involved, mostly men, some women. Samuel Adams, the radical in Boston who kind of started it, it all. Maybe that's why I think they named the beer after him. Benjamin Franklin, who was in his 70s, an envoy to Great Britain and then France, brought France and Spain into the war. Robert Morris, any of you heard of Robert Morris? few of you. We were broke. We didn't have any money to pay the troops. We were printing paper money. We had no credit. Robert Morris was a financier in Philadelphia who came in, got the nation on a hard currency, established the first national bank. He saved the country, as did many of these people. You talk about Patrick Henry, uh, Thomas Paine, Thomas Jefferson. Who was the single heroic celebrity leader there? George Washington did extraordinary things by himself, couldn't have done it. Point number five, great leadership has to achieve substantive, positive results. Good tries ultimately aren't enough. You have to get results. This is change. Not just change for change's sake, not just change because it sounds like a good thing because we don't like what we have, but the results that we want. We need to get the results. The founders won a revolutionary war which took eight years against the world's mightiest army and navy, a ragtag group of people fighting with no boots and coats and muskets that they brought from the farms. They beat the world's mightiest nation. They wrote an unprecedented constitution. Nothing like that had ever been done. It took three years. And even then it didn't have a Bill of Rights. It was three years later before the Bill of Rights got added to it. And they had to do a lot of things. They had to bridge factions. Just because somebody objects doesn't mean that you immediately make them a casualty. You know the story of the Federalists who wanted a strong central government. People like Washington and Adams and, and Madison. And the Anti-Federalists who argued strongly for the Articles of Confederation, strong states' rights, individual states that were like nations and we just have a loose confederation. Three years of arguing. And leadership had to bridge those factions until they finally did. And as a result, they achieved substantive positive results. I would also add that flexibility is required in leadership. What you do in a crisis situation is different than what you do if you've got time to, to sit around the campfire and have a strategic plan and sing kumbaya and stuff like that. But in an emergency situation, we revert to the hierarchy. And you do this, you do that. Okay, but still within the shared values. It depends on the people. How you deal with the tenured faculty at Daniels is different from how you deal with migrant labor that's just come over the border. Or the type of organization, nonprofit, NGO, for-profit organization. But the five principles that I've outlined, I don't think they change. You may have to vary your speaking style. You may have to in, in, in vary how you do the collaborative alignment. But, but the five elements remain the same. So to me, searching for great leadership is my theme. What is great leadership? It's a dynamic interaction between healthy, aligned people who share core values that achieves substantive, positive results. That's the draft that Greg and I would, would offer to you. And as a result of that, my experience with great leadership is that a unique culture emerges. We have the five elements there. And if you do those things, what happens is that 
you get extraordinary participation. People that are fully engaged with a dynamic interaction, who are empowered by the shared values, and have tremendous creativity and innovation, who have great pride in the organization. I ran companies where people were ashamed to wear the polo shirt and the ball cap with the company logo because we were in the papers every day being sued and this kind of thing. And a few years later, there was pride back in the organization. They were bringing friends and colleagues and relatives into the organization. A culture like this moves, as Stephen M. R. Covey says, at the speed of trust. Where trust exists in an organization, the backbiting and the backstabbing and the hurdles and the costs go down and the results go up. Where there's no trust, everybody's watching out for himself. Who's going to get me now? And everything takes longer. And as a result, costs go up and the results go down. And when this kind of culture emerges, uh, as Margaret Mead says in her quote, it does extraordinary things. She says, a small group of dedicated people can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And that's what our founders said. So I think the premises that I cited before are myths. I think leadership, some people may have a little more uh, at the start than others, but can be learned. It's oftentimes an experiment in the unknown. We parachuted into some of those trouble companies sometimes. We had no idea what we were going to do, but confidence we could find answers if we established the right culture. We learned it's about serving people, that control is an illusion. The authority is not necessarily the leader. The, leader can come, the leadership can come from Kathy in the brown bag lunch or the Skunk Works team. That leaders don't protect their power, they share their power. There's not only one leader, there can be plural leadership that, that the, the heroic, charismatic leader risks the greatest threat to leadership, which is the ego. That values-based leadership is much stronger. That leadership at times can be lonely, but frequently great leadership is very connected and in touch with people. And that you can't sometimes meet everyone's expectations. If we're going to solve the problem in the Middle East, for example, the Palestinians can't have all the things that the Israelis want. In Jerusalem, somebody's going to have to give. You can't meet everyone's expectations, otherwise the war goes on forever. And you can't necessarily care for all. Some people want to sabotage the organization, and they must become casualties. So you might ask, can an individual be a great leader? Well, yes. We saw on that first slide some great leaders. Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and things like that. Excellent people who were great leaders. But I think paradoxically, great leadership doesn't come from an individual seeking it. I want to run something. It doesn't happen from that mindset. It happens from getting rid of that mindset. A whole new paradigm is needed that's not leader-focused, but leadership focused, and where the ego is really under control. So to wrap it up, you've heard some of my opinions. Let me give you some cautions. Great leadership can't be perfect. We can't expect our leaders to be perfect. The founders and framers started with the Articles of Confederation which I think would have been a disaster. That's the way they got through the Revolutionary War. The Constitution permitted slavery, a moral outrage, but they realized they couldn't get it done then. They didn't have a Bill of Rights, freedom of speech, press, religion. They had to add that later through the work of the Anti-Federalists, a faction they bridged. Judicial Review came in 1803 in Marbury versus Madison. So leadership can't be perfect. You can only make progress. Leadership is like this is not easy. My experience is all the principles I talk about to people like Mallory in the classroom, they understand. They get them. They're smart. Really hard to practice. Because when you go back to your office, back to your student meeting, the old patterns, the old behaviors come up. And it's really, really hard. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to have self-doubts. It takes courage. I don't think you can do it by yourself. I had a soulmate, have had for 44 years. She was a huge influence on me. Trusted colleagues. 
I had a CFO who once said, so, so right to the point, Bob, my job as your CFO is to be your best friend and your worst critic. To tell it like it is. The emperor doesn't have any clothes. And, you know, this is what we're facing. So it's really hard for a person to do it alone. I think you need trusted colleagues, a personal board of advisors. You need a soulmate, people you can, you can rely on. And I don't want to kid you, my friends, this is risky. The stuff we're talking about here is not the model that prevails in the world today. The old paradigm does. You have to be prepared to be misunderstood and pressured and outcast and to lose your job. I've been fired twice in my life. And it was very hard. It's very sad. Once when I was young, and even more impetuous than some of the stories I've told you. Once when I was very senior and engaged passionately on a transformational search, but I had a board, they wanted the next quarter's earnings. And I, I'll take responsibility, I didn't properly align them and make them understand the transformation and the time it would take. And while we did extraordinary things, they finally ran out of patience. So if you're going to embark upon a path like this, you better say, I better be prepared to lose my job. I'm not kidding. Better be prepared to say, I might lose my job. And you have to decide whether you want to lead like this from values to achieve, to serve, or for power, for ego, for money, and status. I would challenge you to decide right now. How am I going to lead? Simple, you make a decision, and it's hard to implement. But that's the kind of thinking that you have to go through. So in the final analysis, all this comes back to you. I would give my generation a C or a D, maybe generously, for how we did it. I would give Greg's generation a B. I think they're doing it better. What brings me back to places like Daniel's to share my scars and my embarrassing stories is that my hope is that your generation has the potential to be an A because of the things that you're learning here at Daniel's and the extraordinary capabilities that you have. And I really hope and pray that you can do that. So I'll be happy to take your questions. I wish you good luck and God bless. Um, if you would write the questions down like you normally do on the little cards that you found in your seat, like this, we'll pick them up and uh, bring them up here. Actually, our GAs are going to do that, right, Oscar? Okay, so uh, there we've got one back there already. Bob, while well, we've got some uh, writing going on and people are thinking about that, what advice would you give to our MBA graduates? How do I know whether I want to be a leader? Um, I found your comments about how much hard work it is in the 70 and 80 hour week uh, to be one of those things I surely want to think about. But it sounds like there's also a struggle in terms of balance in one's own life. There's something on a personal level that you give up if you choose to, um, if, if you choose to be a leader. I think, well, the first part of your question, how do you know you want to be a leader? I don't think you have a choice. You're going to have to lead at certain times. It may be your family. It may be uh, your aging parents. It may be in your church or your synagogue. You're going to have to step up to some kind of leadership opportunity uh, when a crisis comes up in your neighborhood. So I think you're going to have to lead at some point in life. You can't always choose to follow. I think struggling with the issues of balance in your life is an excellent question. The first thing I didn't do is endorse Greg's book coming out in March, uh, Life Entrepreneurs, Ordinary People Leading Extraordinary Lives. He and I have spent countless hours and they've done 55 interviews with very, very successful people about how they can have an authentic, balanced life. It takes work, it takes sharing, it takes a lot of planning, but it absolutely can be done. The mistakes that I made and 
working 70, 80 hours a week and never being home when my children were growing up. You don't have to do that. There are times you're going to have to do that, but if you make that the pattern of your life, you're really in denial about what, what your true priorities are. So it can be done, uh, but it just takes a lot of prioritization and work, Sam. Uh, we have a question here uh, that strikes home for a lot of CEOs. Uh, can you really lead authentically as a values-based leader if you're making 500 or 1,000 times more than the other people in the organization? Well, first of all, I think there are many examples of uh, excellent leaders who aren't doing that. I think the examples of egregious pay that we've seen in, in, in many leaders uh, are, are absolutely outrageous. I, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's not possible to say that we're all in this together, we're going to have to have some downsizing, uh, but I'm going to take my uh, $10 million compensation here and HR is going to talk to you about the layoffs. People are going to sit there and say, bull, no way. When, when my co-CEO and I took over recognition equipment, we did it for a dollar a year and 500,000 stock options each. And we had certain goals that we had to meet. And we went out and we had to downsize the company 40%. 40% is huge. It was on the verge of bankruptcy. We couldn't do that if we were taking an outrageous salary. So we took a dollar a year and said, everything we're going to make in this company is based on our success together. So I think it's impossible to keep a straight face and be earning 5,000 times what the, what the shop floor guy is earning, Sam. Um, here's a good one, uh, I think, anyway. What is your criteria to walk away from a bad or hopeless situation? How do you know when it's time to go? Well, you know, all these are just Bob's opinions. Um, certainly many people, I frequently get the question that says, well, Bob, that's fine for you to say uh, you were the CEO or the COO or something like that, but, Thanks. you know, I'm just a middle-level manager, and unfortunately I'm working in an organization that is not this way, it's the old paradigm, you know, what do I do? I think there's a lot you can do. The first thing you can do is role model the behavior that you want. My experience is that even in small departments, if you do the kinds of things that I talked about in the five steps, you can get extraordinary results. Your people will come together, you'll connect with other departments, and you'll start doing extraordinary things. When other people see that, they want to know what's going on and how you do that. So by role modeling the behavior, you can actually set an example that asks other people what you're doing and, and can lead to the path of, of promotion. Sometimes that's not enough. Sometimes you have to go talk to the authority figure privately and say, uh, you have to be very tactful about this. You can't say, you're really blowing it, Joe. You know, you get in everybody's face and you make everybody feel like an idiot and we're all ready to quit. Joe's not going to, you know, really relate to that. What does Joe want? Joe wants financial success, Joe wants uh, status in the organization, or Joe wants pride in the community. You need to talk to Joe about what his goals and objectives are and show how some of his behavior is, is not contributing to that. And uh, at some point then, that may not work. Then the third step in, in my uh, uh, portfolio of tricks is to form allies. And the allies try to put pressure and at some points, the allies have to have a mutiny, perhaps, and try to overthrow throw Joe, because Joe, you may have to go to the board, you may have to go to other stakeholders and say, Joe's the problem here. And at some point, you may have to say, this is impossible, I'm out of here. What I do know is that if you lay down with dogs long enough, you're going to get fleas. And if you're in a bad organization long enough, sooner or later, it's going to get under your skin you're going to have the fleas of not being a values-based leader. So you have to decide whether or not this is a priority for you. See if you can change it from the inside out. If not, get out. And as a related question, I suppose, uh, if you're going to choose a leadership position, what kind, what's your checklist? For example, you and I recently talked about the possibility of you assuming a new leadership position. And you had to go through a whole uh, dialogue with yourself, maybe with your advisor, but what's the criteria? How do I go about deciding where to spend the limited time that I have on the planet? How do I invest my energies? 
It starts in that first module, the, the, the uh, healthy personal core, understanding your personal values, your goals in life. I don't want to sound like a commercial for Greg's book, but he talks exactly about these kinds of things. How can you lead a full, whole life? What can you do? So it talks about what's my purpose in life? What are the values? What are the goals? What's the vision? What's the support group? How am I going to go through this kind of thing? So you need a trusted board of advisors, a soulmate, the CFO who's your best friend and your worst critic, those types of people who you can talk with about these things. You need regular checkpoints to say, how am I doing? And then when a new opportunity comes up, you go back to your plan and say, what's my purpose in life? If I do this, am I going to be uh, uh, operating by the values that are important to me? Do I have an opportunity to achieve or to serve some people? And that's one of the motives that I have for leadership. So it's a very thoughtful, deliberative process that I really think you have to go through with some other people. You can't just do it by yourself, Sam, because it's, it's very difficult to see things for yourself. And I think if you do that thoughtfully, and if you have that healthy personal core, you'll come to the right decision. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is there any one uh, particular experience that you think shaped you into this style of leader? A memory comes back of those days in Dayton, Ohio, at Monarch, when. Uh, I was really operating in the old paradigm, and the company was used to operate, operating that way. We used to have a company picnic, and we used to have a company open house where we'd allow people to come in and walk through the company. And some very creative people who said, um, we can do it a different way. Let's try something. And so we decided to have an open house on one weekend where each department would take some time to illustrate what they do, what they did in the tool room, what they did in the print shop. They'd do signs and little things like that. In the accounts receivable department, they would describe things. And we'd have an open house and invite the families in. And then we decided to leave the open house open all week. This was a very controversial decision because we said, we're going to let all the other employees walk through the other departments and see what they do. Because you always go to your desk. And people said, we can't do that. It'll be a 100% drop in productivity and all this kind of stuff, but, but, but you know, we decided to do it. And people went around and they discovered what other people did. And this guy they thought was a jerk who dinged their car in the parking lot one time was actually a master toolman who, uh, who did wonderful things. And, and people started to talk. And they began planning the company picnic, which we had at the plant that, that night. It was a summer night. It was a beautiful moonlit night. We had all kinds of balloons and carnival. People brought their crafts and their fests, uh, the, 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 uh, you know, all, all the things that they did. And, and, and we had a talent show. And, and we had a, a woman who worked there who was a dwarf. She was very tiny. And people didn't know how to interact with her. And at the end of this week of the company moving around and people talking and understanding what was going on and people showing their crafts and playing the banjo, we had a flatbed truck pulled up to the loading dock in the back of the plant. Beautiful Ohio night, moonlit. And this little gal dwarf got up there and sang a love song. And she had a magnificent voice. Yeah. And the crowd was spellbound. And there were tears coming down because she was shy, embarrassed, and things like that. That's a moment when that company came together and realized the talent and the creativity that people had. Uh, and it really was a, the start of a cultural transformation there. There are moments like that that I can recall that led to this kind of swing feeling that we had. What do you think is the, the main thing that a leader has to do for the team? Most important. I guess I'd answer that, you know, I've got five principles and points, and we've got ten points under collaborative alignment, so there's a lot of detail there. I would, I would say that you have to let people know that it's all about them. This is all about them. This has nothing to do with you. This is not about I want to run something or I want to do this. This is done because I truly, honestly care about you. 
And I have an incredible amount of faith and confidence that we together can figure out the solution to any problem that we have. I don't care how dark the days are. We can do it together. If you honestly, sincerely believe that and convey that, people will respond. Is sincerity the meat of that? I mean, I, Oh, it's not just sincerity. How you, it's how you convey that to a large group of people is something of a mystery to us. I think you need to be open with them. I yeah. think you need to be, you know, in my generation, the leader could never admit they made a mistake. They always had to be in control. They always had to have an answer. They always need to have all the knowledge or the expertise. People know you don't have that. You can pull, fool some of the people all the time and all the people. You can't, can't fool them very long. They know. So if you get up there and try, your, try to BS your way through it, um, they're going to know. So you have to be able to say, I screwed that up. I don't understand. I'm lost. I'm scared. You know. Now, you don't do that all the time. You don't go around saying all the time, oh, I'm lost, I'm scared, because you know, that's not going to be very inspirational. But there are moments when you have to be able to say, I don't know, but I think if we get in the room together, we can figure this out. So I think you have to show not only Colin's humility, but I think you have to show Colin's vulnerability while also being strong, while also being courageous, while also being inspirational. So it's that soft and hard, it's that yin and yang, that kind of authenticity has to be there and you have to be willing to show it. Is there a way to learn those kinds of things uh, without actually going out and leading other people? How can I warm up to this? I mean, you can certainly listen to me or read a lot smarter people than I am. The best way to learn it is to take on the leadership of a project. Take on anything. Chair the United Way campaign. Get involved in some student organization here. And be open and go through the mistakes. Read this stuff. Be an open book. But, but practice the leadership. This, I think this stuff can only be learned experientially. It can't be learned intellectually. Because the, that the bad habits, the old paradigms that we have, are so ingrained. I think you have to go through it and feel the pain, feel the exhilaration of swing, and learn from it and get better. So I think you have to begin to lead. Okay, this is a really touchy question, <laughs> but somebody wants to know if you would take a look at the current field of candidates for president <laughs> and uh, talk about their leadership qualities or lack thereof. Whoa! <laughs> this is a no-win question, right? Well, if I'm honest with my model, I would have to say that I, of the seven or eight major candidates right now, um, and I've studied them pretty carefully. I've read Obama's book. I've watched Hillary Clinton. I've followed the Republican Party for some, some length. I don't think I'd give any of them great marks on some of the things here uh, that we're talking about, some more than others. Do they have a moral compass, or are they really just ambitious? trying to get out, so I want to run something, you know. Or is there a moral compass? Do they, do they truly want to serve? Do they really have the humility and the vulnerability? I, I mean, certainly there are many examples that they do have. John McCain was tortured in Vietnam. He's never put an earmark into a spending bill and things like that. But he's got a temper, you know, and, and, and he's, he's run over some people. Romney, you know, has a lot of excellent things going for him, but at the same time, he switched positions so many times, I wonder, is there a moral compass there? Is, is there a shared set of values? Giuliani's done some outstanding things. He's, he, he's wonderful, yet toward the end of his reign as mayor of New York before 9-1, he was pretty tyrannical, an old paradigm, dictatorial, things like that. Um, Barack Obama, has, he's a wonderfully inspirational kind of person. When I read the first chapters of his book, I was really excited. But I see some of the votes he's uh, made uh, in, in, in the Senate or in the Illinois legislature uh, for uh, union things or against free trade. And I say, boy, those are really just beholden to the old constituencies. So I have yet to see somebody who I really say, I'll follow you into the, into the fires of hell. You know? uh, I, and, and, and that's why I look to you. So I look to you to think through these kinds of things and say, geez, guys, when you're my age, I hope you have a crop of presidential candidates as good and as well qualified as they are. I don't mean to demean those good people, but they are not what the 21st century needs yet. 
I think we need a, a big, big jump beyond that. Sorry, it's the best I can do with that one. What's, what are the biggest challenges and opportunities uh, for people in business, as you see it, over the next 10 to 20 years? Oh, there are huge opportunities in biotechnology and space exploration and robotics and nanotechnology and China and India, globalization. There are huge opportunities. I don't think there's ever been a time the energy uh, challenges, the healthcare uh, challenges, space. These are all business opportunities where people can really do wonderful things. So uh, what are the problems? I think the problems are what we're talking about here in this room today. That the kind of leadership that we've had in business organizations, government organizations, has, hasn't evidenced these kinds of principles. So we get the same old stuff recycling again and again. The scandals will come back again and again. Sarbanes-Oxley is already being diluted. So unless we correct this stuff, then whether it's environmental issues or healthcare issues or educational challenges or business opportunities, unless we fix the leadership kind of stuff, we're going to repeat the same cycles again. Sounds like uh, ego is one of the core themes here. And certainly it's a challenge that we all face. And um, some of us, like me, don't ever seem to be able to get on top of it. Uh, I find my self-interest always coming up in my life and sort of dominating, at least on an emotional level. Um, is there an exercise that you go through personally or some experience that allowed you to turn a corner on that particular piece? It's a small step, maybe it's the first step, but it's the hardest step, I think, to make towards leadership, is to find something larger than yourself to dedicate yourself to and leave those self-interests behind. I think having something larger than yourself that you believe in, whether it's God or a cause or something like that, is extraordinary. I think the ability when you get knocked down, I've been knocked down and it's been really hard. It's been really embarrassing to go through some of the things that I went through in my life. It was painful. But having the ability to get up and look back and learn from it is really important. But I think equally important to those two is the ability the, the human mind has an infinite ability to rationalize its own actions. So you really have to have a soulmate or a group of people who are trusted that will tell you what it is that you need to hear. You need to have a personal board that you check in with regularly to give you that feedback because we can't recognize our own actions. We start out with good intentions and we just make make compromising decisions and all of a sudden we don't realize it and, and so you have to have that group of people who can give you the feedback. So something bigger than yourself, the courage to get up from all the adversity that you will experience and a trusted group of people who will lovingly tell you what you need to hear. Those are three things I would recommend. Okay. Um, is there a difference in leadership style uh, for a private company versus a public company? Sure. I think when I talked about variabilities in leadership, depending on the situation, depending on the type of people, depending on the organization, uh, even though I was a pretty new paradigm CEO, I hope, um, when I move into the nonprofit sector and now work on a lot of volunteer boards, I, can't, I, I don't have the same authority structural power that I had before. And so you're working with volunteers, you're working with other people who have been very successful. You have to absolutely vary your leadership style. But certain things are constant. The healthy personal core, the synthesis of a shared future based on shared values, the collaborative alignment, the plural leadership, and the, and the understanding you have to achieve results. Those are constants, but a lot of other things vary. Can you talk a little bit, for those of us who are older here, um, can you talk a little bit about the transition from leading large groups of people to a more private life, as in retirement, when you leave those positions? Or maybe you're in leadership in one position, you go to another organization where you're required to be a follower. Uh, this is something that I'm sure you have faced recently. Are there some tricks to that? I think it goes back to your healthy personal core, to understanding your personal values, your purpose in life, the goals, what you want to uh, leave as your legacy. Uh, it's uh, Scott McLagan, if he's still in the audience, was talking about this before, a book uh, called, I think, Managing Your Portfolio or something like that, where you view yourself as a portfolio of things. And now I'm a portfolio of 
business executive, but now I'm going to teach, and now I'm going to work in nonprofits. So what you're doing, there's no such thing as retirement anymore. I'm 65 years old. I'm so busy and active and things, you know, because you're just doing different things right now. So you just decide what are the priorities that you want to do to achieve the goals and purpose that you have in your life. Uh, and you just manage that portfolio in some learnful way with some advice from colleagues. Um, I have a question about the troublemakers, and I found myself also wanting you to speak more to that issue when you were going through it on your slides. Um, I do a whole class on that. Do you? Class. That's yeah. good. Yeah. Only one? <laughs> it's almost a course. Um, tell us how you go about identifying the troublemakers and when you stop giving them more chances and then how you can get them out of the organization without leaving the impression uh, that, you, uh, that you don't respect them? Well, oh, excellent question. This is not an easy thing. I'm not sure I can articulate a, an, an artful answer. It really just is a lot of hard work. It's getting out there. It's not just saying to the HR VP, give me a list of all the good guys and the bad guys. That's total abdication of it. It's really getting out there and traveling with the people, going to the foreign countries, going to the, to the subsidiaries, sitting down at dinner, meeting them for breakfast, seeing how they react in a meeting, judging things. And, and it's always little signals. And the little signals to me are always just foreshadowings of big things that are going to come later on. So take notes. Listen to those little signals. Talk to people. You know, and you don't say, well, Pete, what do you think about John? But you just start talking about how we doing together, what's happening, and you'll pick up those little clues. And then you have to just really sit down with the person and understand. You have to look at some of their past decisions, study their history. You have to talk about the synthesis of the shared future, the shared values. If they're not going to honor the share va shared values, they really are an amoral leader or an immoral leader, and they're not going to really support you. So you really have to go through that careful process. You may have a lot of time. Uh, sometimes you only have 30 or 60 days, and you have to make your best call. Um, I had to fire a drug dealer one time at Pitney Bowes who was running, who was dealing drugs inside Pitney Bowes. There was no, there was no question about that. We had armed guards there. We had armed guards at the office. We had armed guards at my house for several months in New Canaan, Connecticut, because that was a dirty guy. Most people you don't take care of that way. The, the, the old concept, unless you know they're going to be a saboteur, and they are few and far between, you must honor the legacy that they did. It, and it's not their fault in most cases. They were improperly motivated or supervised or whatever. They're just not going to get the program. So you need to be able to treat them with dignity and respect. I remember one time at Recognition in Dallas, we decided we had to uh, part with the plant manager. And I told him that Friday morning. And we happened to be having another all-hands meeting down in Dallas that day. And he was standing there in the audience. It was outside in the hot Dallas summer sun. And I saw him there, and I just knew what I had to do, because the word had gone around that Tom was leaving the organization. So I said to Tom, Tom, you know, this is your last day. I'm sure everybody's going through a lot of process. Why don't you come up to the microphone here and say whatever's in your heart? And I heard the people behind me, my vice president, say, what? <laughs> You just fired him this morning. He could trash you. He could terminate. I mean, he could do all kinds of things. And it was a risk. He might have done that. I didn't think that was what was going to happen. And because we had an excellent out outplacement program, and we planned a, a party for Tom to acknowledge what he had done. And he got up there, and he spoke from his heart, and he said, this is really a hard day for me. I don't know what I'm going to do next. I'm 55 years old. But you know what? I have loved my time here. This is a great company. I have a lot of confidence in you people. I'm going to figure out something. The company is going to help, help me. And, and it was just the right thing to do. Treating people that way, even if you have to make a tough decision, I think pays great dividends. There are times you have to have the armed guards. I, I, I'm not being naive. That's the very rare exception, in my opinion. No, I think that's an interesting distinction that I see in you, and I, I just I want to talk a little in a little more depth about that. It sounds to me like some of these people may want to go home. <laughs> uh, yeah, but that's their problem. <laughs> um, you know, I think that what I'm hearing you say is is you think of all people as having 
proper motivation for what they're doing, even though they may be against you. Even though they may be a troublemaker, you start from the premise that they're still good people. Am I hearing that correctly? I'm not naive, Sam. I think that there are some evil people in the world. The drug dealer at Pitney Bowes, or mm -hmm. Adolf Hitler, or a lot of people like that. So there is evil in the world, I think. And, and you have to be prepared to defend innocent people against evil, the drug dealer at Pitney Bowes. I think, in my experience, most people have more goodness in them than badness. And most people have the capability to do some changing. Not a lot. I see it in thirds. Most organizations have a third of the people, you give them this message, they love it, they want to be there. Another third sit there and say, wait till this suit passes too. Uh, and, and, and the middle third can go either way. Okay? You begin working with a good third and role modeling good stuff. And the middle group starts to, starts to really get with the program. Then you have to sort out that bad third. And maybe 10% of the total population, or 5%, has that whiner, mutterer, give them a chance, but they're just too ingrained. They mm -hmm. just have been, have been beat up too badly, and they're going to hurt the organization. Those you have to take out. Hmm. Okay. One last question, and I'll, I don't know if it, anybody, you want to go? Or you want me to ask some more questions? Oh, go ahead. Okay, well, one more question, and this actually comes from someone in the audience. Uh, if there were one person in all of history that you would point to who exemplifies this leadership style, who would that be and why? Any leader that I cite, I can cite a list of negatives. So take the traditional people that might be on that list. Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, uh, Winston Churchill, you know, I can give you the list of the negatives. Suffered from depression, alcoholic, you know, temper, uh, you know, made a bad judgment call on supporting this cause or whatever. So, um, I, I probably, the, and I don't mean this in a religious basis at all, because I'm not proselytizing for Christianity or anything, but probably Jesus comes closest uh, to some of these principles, and, 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 uh, but it's very difficult, so I'm fumbling myself with an answer here. But he wasn't a capitalist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're not doing such a good job of following him, but I followed the remarks that you made and was fascinated by them. Thank you very much, Bob.